Hi, I'm Deanna Springer. On behalf of Nancy Zeman Productions and PBS Wisconsin, thank you for joining us for this special educational presentation. Please add your questions for the presenter in the chat and stay tuned for a Q&A after the lecture. Then be sure to explore everything else the Great Wisconsin Quilt Show has to offer, including beautiful quilt exhibits and an interactive vendor mall. Thank you and enjoy. Hi, I'm Nina McVeigh, former long arm and quilt specialist for Bernina of America. Welcome to this session on ruler work quilting. Whether you are a beginning free motion quilter or a machine quilter who wants to perfect your skills, ruler work may be the answer. Ruler work quilting is very exact, which is one of the things that appeals to so many people. By following the edge of a ruler, you will get exact and repeatable designs. Let's take a look at some samples of ruler work quilting. As we look at some ruler work projects, you can see that this project was done with straight lines. So the only ruler I needed was a straight edge ruler. The grid in the center nine patch and then the border around the outside was created with a straight edge ruler. I'm showing you this pillow even though it was done with a diamond ruler because it could be done with a straight edge ruler. You would just need to do some marking so you knew where to stitch those straight lines. Moving into curves, this is a half circle curve and this creates our clamshell design in the center of this pillow. I also love the border that a half circle ruler can create. Using that same type of ruler, you see an orange peel design in this nine patch. This is a great design for a four patch, which you will see again in our presentation, or the nine patch or a 16 patch, or even a checkerboard area on a quilt. While feathers aren't necessarily a basic design, I did want to show you the combination of a more complex design and then those simple straight lines. And speaking of combining designs, this pillow top um, has your straight, your straight lines, your curves and arcs and circles. A very simple design once you figure it out and then you can repeat it as often as you would like. Here's another example of combining designs. So I have my straight edge my arcs, my circles, and that beautiful curved grid in the center of the pillow. The feathers were done with free motion. So adding ruler work and free motion together really can create some beautiful designs. And then I have one more. Again, just a, an example of combining ruler work with free motion. Simple straight lines for your border arcs in your triangles, and then that same curve to create an oval shape in the white border, and then, of course, adding free motion in the feathers and the stippling to this project. Now that we have looked at a few samples of ruler work quilting, let's take a look at the supplies that you will need to get started. As you are setting up your machine for ruler work quilting, you need to think about the surface that will support the ruler. Most machines come with a slide on table and this works. It does support a ruler and your project, but a better situation would be to have the large acrylic table. These are of course bigger and made specifically for your machine. The larger surface will support the ruler and um, the larger project. However, the best case scenario would be to have your machine down in a sewing cabinet. You can see that you've got a nice, large, even surface to work on. You will want to put a straight stitch throw plate on your machine. This is something you should have on whenever you piece your quilt as that will perfect the straight stitch. You will need a ruler work foot, which is a free motion foot. 
where all the edges of the foot are a quarter of an inch from the needle. The thick outside edge of the foot, called the fence, keeps the ruler from sliding under or over the foot. Because this is a free motion technique, your feed dogs need to be lowered. You will also need quilting rulers, which are traditionally a quarter of an inch thick. However, there are some domestic machines where a quarter inch ruler is too thick to use all the way around the foot. Therefore, manufacturers have now come out with three sixteenths inch rulers. If you can use quarter inch rulers, I would stick with those, as the thinner rulers can slip under the foot, especially if your foot hops. You may also want something for the back of the ruler to keep it from slipping. Some rulers come with a non-slip texture. However, as a beginner, you may want more non-slip material. There are adhesive sandpaper-like products, adhesive rubber-like products, as well as sprays. As far as what rulers you might want to get started with, I would suggest a straight ruler and a curve or circular ruler and in different sizes. As you shop for rulers, understand that they are an investment. They're an investment in your craft and you will use them over and over again. Some of us have quite an extensive collection. I have created a placemat project for you. It's a simple pieced project, but it will give you the opportunity to quilt along the edge of a straight ruler doing grid work, and it will give you the opportunity to quilt a four patch block as well as borders. If you are inclined just to want to practice on a fat quarter sandwich, that's fine too. You can draw those shapes on your fabric. For the placemat project, you will want four to five fat quarters or scraps. You will need batting and backing, 16 inches by 20 inches, and a sixth of a yard for binding. For the center of the placemat, you will cut four three and a half inch squares from two fabrics if you're using fat quarters, up to four fabrics if you're using scraps. Cut two squares, six and a half inches from one fabric for the side squares, and then two strips, four and a half inches by 18 and a half inches for your borders. For binding, you will cut two strips, two and a half inches by the width of the fabric. With very simple piecing, you will put the placemat together. So the center square you will um, piece together with the four smaller squares, add the two outer squares, and then add the two borders. And that is the placemat that we will start doing our ruler work quilting on. To begin ruler work quilting, we will stitch a straight line grid in these outside squares. I have my ruler foot on, my feed dogs are lowered, and I have my straight stitch throat plate on. The first thing you want to do is pull up your bobbin thread where you're going to begin stitching. So I'm going to lower my foot and then lower your needle, raise your needle, and you can move aside to pull up that bobbin thread. So now I know where both threads are. I'm going to go back and lower my needle into the fabric where I'm going to begin stitching. We will be using a straight edge ruler. So this one, you, I think you can see, um, has lots of markings on it. All of the line markings are a quarter of an inch apart. So when I start stitching, um, I'll be able to line up the correct spacing. I want my lines to be an inch apart. I'm going to put the ruler against the foot. Now, it's important to remember that you're not going to push hard against the foot. That will make moving your fabric difficult and it can also change the tension. So I'm just lining that up against the foot and I'm looking that as I come down, I'm going to be stitching from corner to corner. Begin by taking a couple small stitches to secure your threads.
Now, as I get down to this far corner, my ruler isn't quite long enough, so all I'm going to do is slide. and stop when I get to the end. I'm now going to turn my fabric and I'm going to stitch in the ditch to get my spacing. You'll notice as I line this ruler up, I can line up these outside tabs on the seam line and then I can be stitching right in the ditch. Turn this and check. Yep, I'm on that third line over, plus I'm stitching a quarter of an inch away from the ruler, so that's going to give me my inch spacing. Turn. Again, use the tabs on this ruler and that will give us our one inch spacing and be right in the ditch. Stitch back. Right to the seam. Again, turn, stitch in the ditch. Now you'll notice that I always put my ruler on the left side of the foot. If you are left-handed, you might find it easier to put your ruler on the right side of the foot. It really doesn't make any difference. You just have to find where you're comfortable. I'm not quite as far as I want to be, so I'll take a couple more stitches, line that up. And stitch. Now of course with a grid you want to go um, across your your block in in two directions. Right now I'm going to stitch up to the corner because I don't have enough room for another line. And now I'm going to stitch the other diagonal. Slide the ruler. Okay. So now I want to travel again. for that next row of stitching. And you're going to continue this using the ditch or the outside edge for travel until you have your block completed with grid quilting. The two gridded squares are now complete, and I want to focus on this center four patch. In order to complement the straight lines of the grid work, I'm going to be doing some curved quilting. I want to add a curve on the inside edge of each of these blocks. To do that, I'm going to be using a circle, half circle ruler. This comes in a set of four different rulers in four different sizes. This is the four inch ruler. Now remember, these are three inch blocks. So of course the four inch ruler seems like it would be too big for the three inch block. But I only want to quilt an arc. I don't want to quilt a complete half circle, just the arc. As I look at this ruler, there are lines um, across the top. This top line is two and a half inches long. If I add the quarter inch allowance that I need for my foot on both ends of the line, that gives me three inches, which of course, this would be the three inches. So I'm going to lay that line 
on my seam line. You can see that I do have um, gripping surface on the back of this ruler to keep it from sliding. So as I put that line right on my seam line, there is one other thing I want to look at. How far away am I from this seam line? This is where I want to end up. It should be a quarter of an inch. But if my piecing isn't quite exact, I may have to back this ruler up a little bit. And I mention that because you will run into situations where the ruler is exact, but you might need to compensate for uh, piecing that isn't quite perfect. I'm going to take a couple tiny stitches to secure and then stitch around the edge of the ruler to the first seam line. Now, as I said, I want to add a curve to the inside edge of all of these squares, but I don't want to do each square individually. So I want to study the squares and come up with a pathway so that I know I won't have to stop and start over. Here is a drawn out pathway for a four patch block, something you might want to consider and study a bit before you approach your block with your sewing machine. Now that we've seen the pathway, I'm going to stitch across, stopping in the center, move my ruler, and I'm always looking, am I going to end up a quarter of an inch away? I'm now going to take my ruler and turn it. Now I could turn my work, and maybe I'll do that so you can actually see some of that stitching happening there. And so I'll turn, check that I'm going to be a quarter of an inch away. Do another arc. Let me turn this back to the original orientation. So I went down, over, over, back, back, and now I'm going to go down again. And there you have your orange peel design. Now that we have the center of our placemat complete, we are going to concentrate on the borders. You'll see on this border, I have actually drawn out three inch squares all along the length of the border. We will be doing something very similar to what we did in our center block, only this time we will be using the three inch circle, half circle ruler from the, the set of four rulers. Because these are three inch blocks, this is a three inch ruler, we will be doing half circles to the inside of each of the four sides of the squares. We'll begin down on the end and we will raise our bobbin thread as we have been doing. And then, again, before I ever put a ruler next to the foot, I want to make sure my needle is down and my foot is down. Put the half circle line on that basting, quarter inch basting line that I have there, or it could be a drawn line. Take a couple stitches and then come around the edge of the ruler. Stop when you get to the basting line or drawn line. 
move your ruler so that that half inch line is on the bottom drawn line. And stitch. Now as I come to the line, and you can see that here, as I come to this first line, this first line sectioning off this square, I'm going to go up that line and down that line. So line up your ruler, stitch up to the top, and then down to the bottom. And as I look at this, I want to look right here where my stitching line is for this half circle that I'm a quarter of an inch away so that those two half circles just touch. Creating a design. And I'm going to continue along that border coming across going up stitching down Doing the last arc, you'll come around to where you started. So you'll have this great border design. As we look at this border design, I want to clean up this bottom edge a little bit. So I'm going to take my placemat lower my foot and pull up my thread and I want to stitch on that drawn line so I'll go back to my straight edge ruler and I'm going to stitch another line. Slide the ruler. And so now with those two lines of stitching I have a really nice border. We now have our orange peel border done, which looks totally different using half circles than it did in the block using an arch. But now it's time to look at our last and final border. Here is where it really gets fun. What kind of design can I do with a straight edge ruler? Or what kind of designs can I do with a circle or half circle or arc? And depending on what size ruler you have, as you collect different rulers, your options are going to be even greater. We are going to use the three inch arc ruler for this final border. I'm going to turn this and lower my foot and pull up my bobbin thread and then lower my needle into the fabric again. Now I, as I said, I'm using the three inch arc ruler and I have put little marks every three inches just to keep me on track. And this time I want a really deep arc here. So I'm using, there are three lines here across the bottom. I'm actually using this top line. 
And that's going to give us a really deep arc. Going to finish that arc, come back, line my ruler up again, look to see that I'm a quarter of an inch away from that mark. And as we come around, each arc, because it's so deep, will stitch on top of the other one. I've now turned my work, pulled up my bobbin thread. I'm going to use that same line on the edge of my fabric to line that up with. Now I know that because I've got a seam allowance here, this arch will be si slightly shorter than this one, but I wanted this intersection to happen not right in the middle of the border, but offset just a little. It's just a design option and you are the designer. So move that and you are going to just repeat this same process all the way along the edge of your border coming in from the outside edge. We will finish out our last arc. And there you have our final border. Now I could go back and add some, some free motion quilting in these little football shapes, but I really like it like this. So I'm going to leave it, trim up my placemat, and add the binding. I have put binding on my placemat and now I'm ready to set the table. Now that you've quilted a few basic designs with rulers, let's take a look at expanding on those designs. Looking at this placemat, I've used all the same rulers that we've used today in our project. The designs here are just a little bit more extensive, a little bit more thoughtful. If you look at that bottom border, just straight lines, but how interesting a design you can make with straight lines. The orange peel designs are typical orange peel designs, but I've started to fill in with a little bit of curved grid work in between those um, orange peel designs. And then as we look up to the top border, playing with lines and grid work and just creating a pattern. This is one reason I love rulers. You get to play, design, create, and enjoy. As we come to the end of this presentation, I hope you will take the time to create this simple placemat or perhaps a whole set of placemats so you can practice your ruler work. I hope you explore the world of ruler work and that you enjoy it as much as I do. I want to thank you for coming to this presentation and I hope to see you again next year. Until then, happy quilting. Hi, I'm Deanna Springer. Thank you for joining us for the Great Wisconsin Quilt Show and thank you for tuning in for quilting with rulers on a domestic machine with Nina McVeigh. And we're so pleased to have Nina with us today for a live Q&A. Hi, Nina, how are you? Hi, Deanna, good. Great to see you. And we need to jump to right into you. the Q&A because the questions are flooding in with your or ruler work. We'll get started right away. The first question is from Eunice. She sees lots of ads for rulers. What should she be looking for when she buys her rulers? Well, I think you want to look for some basic rulers, certainly a straight line ruler, something with an arc, as you saw in the video, 
Uh, what you need to know is what kind of ruler does your machine take? What thickness of ruler? Um, rulers come in either a quarter inch thickness, which is your standard thickness, and then three sixteenths uh, inch thickness for your low shank machine. So, so you need to know what, what your machine uh, will accommodate. If your machine will accommodate a quarter of an inch ruler, then that is the one you should always purchase. Great tip, thank you. And Beth R is asking, how can you do ruler work if your machine presser foot hops up and down? Okay, um, it's something you get used to. Uh, certainly you want to be able to have that quarter inch ruler because that's a little bit thicker. Um, the hopping mechanism on a machine doesn't really bother me, but there are many machines, many of the Bernina machines, which I'm familiar with, um, you can take that hopping mechanism off by going to your presser foot pressure and lowering that pressure to below zero, and then the foot will no longer hop. So you can try that. Great tip also. And Susan is asking, which machines do not accommodate quarter inch rulers? Uh, that's a question that that I really personally don't know. I, I am familiar, as I said before, with Bernina machines. I know they accommodate the quarter inch rulers. Um, your best, the best advice I can give you is to go to your local dealer, uh, depending on what brand machine you have. So uh, they would be able to tell you uh, what machine or what size ruler to buy, what thickness of ruler to buy. Great, thank you. And Pam from Lansing is asking, where can I find the directions for the placemat you're showing? Well, the placemat is, is really a very simple placemat with just squares and rectangles, but um, I will have that, um, the directions for this particular placemat posted on my website, ninamcvay.com. That website is still under construction, so I would say give it a, another week or two and you will find it on the website. Great, thanks for sharing those with us. And we can also rewatch the video too and see yes. how you put it together. Yes. Uh, another question, what other projects have you made with this technique? Uh, I've done quite a few uh, ruler work projects from something as you know simple as the placemat you just saw or pillows. Um, I've done ruler work on full-size quilts you know, it's once you learn the technique, it's it's a quilting technique, a free motion quilting technique that you can use on any project. And you've shown us how to, to do this on a small project like a placemat or a pillow, and, and then we can really perfect our techniques. Your stitches look so beautiful on your sample. Oh, thank you, uh, thank you. A viewer from Lots West Virginia is asking, uh, can you do ruler work with the walking foot or a stitch in the ditch foot on a domestic machine? Ruler work is a free motion technique. So you are dropping your feed dogs. Um, a walking foot is a great foot for straight line quilting, but you wouldn't be running that foot along the edge of a ruler. So I'm going to say no, uh, you can't do ruler work with a walking foot or an edge stitch foot. Uh, but again, those are, those are great for straight line quilting. And uh, Michelle C. is asking, on a small item like this, can you rotate the entire project around so you're stitching towards yourself? She says it would be more intuitive for her rather than stitching backwards. Um, absolutely. You can certainly rotate your project to orientate it to uh, whatever you're comfortable with or where, however you're getting the best stitching. I do caution you, however, uh, in the learning process, if you want to do more than small projects, uh, think about those things you might want to do that you can't easily rotate. And so it's always a good idea to do some practicing and learn how to um, stitch away from you or, you know, and, and do it on a small project or even just a, um, a, a sample piece that you're playing with just to get that feel and practice it. So when you are doing a large project, um, you don't have to turn the quilt. Great advice, thank you. Uh, Karen from Indiana is asking, what do you set the stitch length at? Uh, good question. Now remember, I just said it's free motion. So 
in free motion quilting, you are in charge of that stitch length. That's part of this learning curve. Um, anytime you do free, free motion stitching, you are in charge of the stitch length. So even with ruler work, you are in charge of the stitch length. So, so you are not setting that length um, at any particular uh, amount, stitches per inch, unless you're using a stitch regulator. Okay, Michelle had that same question, so you've covered both of their questions. And Doris well, what I will say is, can I just ask, <laughs> answer that about a stitch regulator? Um, there is not a stitch regulated ruler foot. You do need a ruler foot and it is not stitch regulated. So as I said, stitch regulated, uh, unless you have a long arm, because this is also a long arm technique, and whether you, you would have a table model long arm or a frame long arm, the Bernina machines have a stitch regulator in the bobbin area. Therefore, you would set a stitch length and therefore you would get those even stitches without the learning curve that you have on a domestic machine. That's a great tip and a, a difference between the machine types. Thanks for mm -hmm. sharing that. Uh, Doris is asking if I do uh, a circle, so if she's stitching a cir circle, excuse me, from 12 o'clock to six o'clock, it's great. Mm -hmm. But when she goes from six o'clock back to 12 o'clock, it's not so great. She's heard some machines don't like to go a certain directions. Any truth to that? Oh boy, um, there may be some some truth to that, but I think probably most likely that's in the practicing. Um, sometimes because it's it's just a different motion for us, a different feel. We work harder at it, or we may unconsciously be pushing against the foot harder because we're afraid we're going to wander away. Uh, there's just so many things that can happen. Uh, but pushing against the foot too hard will will change that quality of the stitch and can change the tension. So I would tell you one of two things. Either rotate your fabric, as we talked about before, uh, because it would be the same motion. Or if you are really trying to do 360 degrees without turning your fabric, then it comes down to that. And I know you hate to hear it, but it comes down to that word practice. Um, and get a feel for, for what you're doing. You know, nobody, nobody started out with things perfect right away. So we do have to put in the time sometimes. Good advice. And how did you get started quilting? Wow. Um, I've been quilting for many, many, many years. Um, and I actually worked on long arm machines in, in the sense that I helped develop um, Bernina's long arm machine. Therefore, I, I became more familiar with long arming. Ruler work is traditionally a long arm technique. So that's where I started with ruler work because I was working on a long arm and then everybody wanted to be able to do it. So um, going to the domestic machine and learning how to do it on a domestic machine um, just became part of the journey. Well, I'm glad you've developed the technique as well as our viewers are. And Bob is asking, Nina, great job. Do you ever find it easier to free motion in the ditch rather than to grab a straight ruler? Um, you know, if I'm doing free motion and free motioning in the ditch, I really like to use the ruler. Um, I'm not as steady necessarily uh, just guiding my fabric along without something to help me. So certainly if you have a steady hand and you can free motion in the ditch, go for it. I tend to like my ruler just to help me um, stay in the ditch. Okay. Robin is asking, I find my stitches are good when going left to right, but not so great when moving right to left. Is this a common issue? I wouldn't say it's common necessarily. Um, left to right, right to left, they, they really should look the same. Again, I'm going to address that same issue with perhaps in one direction versus the other, um, there's something else going on. It isn't just the stitching. It, there's something else going on, whether it's with the, the um, push against the foot or... Um, 
No, I, I, I don't know. I, it isn't a common issue. It shouldn't happen once you put in the practice and you're guiding correctly. Okay, thank you. Uh, Donna mm -hmm. is asking, what marking device did you use on the yellow border of the placemat? Um, I believe on the yellow border, uh, because I, I needed the visibility, I used a water-soluble marker. Uh, and I do like the ceramic tip sew line markers for that. Um, and it uh, obviously it leaves a nice mark, a nice visible mark, but it uh, comes out with water. Okay, thank you. Betsy is asking, mm -hmm. I really want to learn how to quilt on my domestic machine. As the title says in your lecture, but is this a higher level? What options for the what options are there for those of us who have an entry level machine? Um, it's a great question. I don't know that I would say this is a higher level. Um, certainly there's a learning curve just strictly with free motion, how to move your fabric. Um, one of the biggest things, and I don't think I've mentioned it yet, but I would tell you all to breathe to relax, and I know that's a hard thing to do because you just get tense when you're doing it and shoulders go up, and, but you do have to remember to relax a little bit. Um, I would probably do a little bit of free motion, but I have taught classes, uh, in-person classes, with people who have never done any free motion, and um, I've taught just basic ruler work and they've been thrilled with it because it may be that you've tried free motion a little bit and you just feel you're just really not good at it. You don't know what to do or where to go or what pattern you're doing, where with a ruler, um, it's much more specific. So, so if you have an idea and you're following a guide of, I'm gonna go around the edge of this ruler two or three times in this direction and then come back and you saw the orange peel and in the video and those kinds of things, sometimes that can be a real confidence booster in free motion quilting because otherwise you didn't know what you were going to do. I think they can go hand in hand and you can learn both at the same time. And just jump in and try and try again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mary Lee is asking, what markings should we be looking for on the rulers? Are they black and white markings? You know, it really depends. You want whatever the markings are on a ruler, uh, you want them to show on light fabric and dark fabric because you're not always going to be working on, on one or the other. So you want those markings to show. So if you have a ruler that has um, broken lines, so part of those lines are a light color and part of those lines are a dark color. My rulers are green and white, which is a little different. You don't see those, black and white is good. Um, but something where when you lay the ruler on different values of fabric, different colors of fabric, you're going to see both lines. That's a great tip, Nina. Thank you. And Doris ha or Donna, excuse me, has a similar question. When she goes to purchase her rulers for her domestic machine, she's challenged to find rulers that will fit within the machine's throat plate space. Can you explain what size of ruler she should be looking for? Okay. Well, of course, it's going to depend on your machine. We have machines anywhere from you know five inches of space to twelve inches of space. So that is going to, going to uh, determine the size ruler. But the other thing you have to remember is, for me, most of the time I'm using that ruler on the outside edge of my machine. So I'm not within that throat space. I'm on the outside of the foot. So don't limit yourself to a ruler that will only fit within the throat space of your machine. But it's certainly you, it's something you can keep in mind and, and you will measure that space and, and go from there. But, but again, just realize that you, you probably most of the time, unless you're left-handed, you'll have that ruler on the other side of the foot. Great, and Gwen is asking, she's not very good at lining things up. How easy is it, or do you need lots of practice to do ruler work? Of course you need practice, but I think that, um, I think you might be surprised at how quickly uh, you catch on and how quickly you learn and how quickly 
you can perfect those skills to look really good. Um, if you are not good at lining things up, if you know that about yourself, then I would say you might do a lot of marking on your fabric. Just because it's a free motion technique does not mean that you aren't going to mark your fabric. And I think the more marking you do, um, the more you're going to, to stay on course, as it were. If you're doing grid work, if you have to mark you know, that, that distance for every line, go ahead and mark it. Uh, but the more marking, the more perfect you're going to be. And Teresa is asking about stitch regulation again. In the, in the video, the project you were making in the machine you were using, did you have a stitch regulator on that machine? Uh, that machine, I was not using a stitch regulator. Again, as a domestic machine, I was using a regular ruler foot and there was no stitch regulation, no. Okay, thank you. And Rebecca uh -huh. on Facebook is asking and commenting, great demonstration, thank you. Do you ever have a need to use quilting gloves with ruler work? Um, yes, I, I think if you are a person who uses uh, quilting gloves, if, if that's an aid that you find helpful in your free motion quilting, by all means use it in ruler work. Um, I just don't use them very often. So it isn't something I feel I need, but if you feel you need those gloves, absolutely use them, yes. And Karen from Indiana is asking, what kind of things do you use on the back of the ruler to help it not slip around? Good question. Um, there are lots of different tools for that, different products for that. Uh, one is a sandpaper type product that I like because it grips the fabric, but you have to, I would caution you against it just because it does scratch rulers if, and it will also scratch your table. Um, so if you stack your rulers, it'll scratch rulers, or if you have it on the, the table or your slide on table or whatever, it can cause scratching. There is a rubber back, a rubber type uh, product that I like a lot. Uh, there are um, little sandpaper type discs that you can put on the back. Some people even use a hot glue gun and just squirt hot glue on the back. I would caution you on that one too, uh, because if it's too thick, then your ruler sits up too high. Uh, but I, I tend to like the, um, and I'm not going to be able to remember the name. So, so um, I can't remember it, but it's a, it's a rubber type product. We'll look for it on your website when you put the project yes, up. Yes. Great. Yes. Thanks for sharing those. Those are good tips to be aware of when we're looking for those products. And uh, Michelle is asking, are there any tricks to keeping the foot rail snugged up against the ruler with, without what I can imagine would be a tendency for the ruler to drift away and ruin her quilting design? Yeah, again, that word you don't want to hear, practice. It's a feel, and I think it also comes with confidence. Um, the more practice you have, the more confidence you're going to have, and I think that that, um, that comes with confidence, that, that you won't be pushing too hard. And maybe it's a similar answer for Marcia's question. How do you keep the ruler straight as you reposition it on your fabric? Um... It's a good question. Uh, I think sometimes it, it might be in marking. In, in my mind, the question you're asking is if you have to stop, of course, um, and move your ruler because, because you will have to do that at times, even if it's a straight ruler, you always want to stop with your needle down in your fabric and, and make sure your foot stays down and then slide the ruler to the next position. Uh, if you have things marked, if you have markings on your fabric, it's going to be easier to realign that, that ruler up again. Great tip. Thank you, Nina. Mm -hmm. And Ellen is asking about continuous stitching. Do you have any tips on figuring out the pattern before you start stitching so she can have continuous stitching? Yes. Um, you can actually draw your pattern on paper. Before you start, um, you can either do it on paper, you can get a piece of clear plastic and lay it over the top of your project and do some practicing. Um, if you're using plastic, I would use a, uh, a marker that you, like a dry erase marker that you can take off. A lot of times I will take 
my project, uh, even a picture of my project, and I will put a piece of tracing paper over it, and I will use rulers um, to figure out the pattern before you start. Yes. Oh, that's a great. And you tip. might need. I was going to say you might even want to do some measuring. So if you're using a certain size ruler and you've got a certain size distance, we'll do some dividing to figure out how many repeats you have. And but certainly plan it before you start. Sure, and then keep that pattern nearby so you can reference it when you're yes. actually doing the stitching. Mm -hmm. Yes, good point. Mm -hmm. yeah. I did some uh, spider web stitching on a table runner and I put it away for a couple weeks and got it back out this weekend. And I didn't remember how I did it. I had to study it. So if you're not doing it in the same, same stitching session, it's, it's good to have that reference. Yes. And Jerry is asking, since you've done both long arm and domestic ruler work, true confessions, which do you find easier or prefer? Um, true confession, I have to say it's easier to move the machine along the edge of the ruler because you're only doing one thing. With domestic ruler work, you are moving the um, fabric and the ruler, keep, trying to keep them both together as you move it along the edge of the foot. Um, so yes, at the frame, I feel is a little easier, but it certainly doesn't limit anyone who doesn't have that kind of equipment to do ruler work. Thank you. And Janet is asking about the ruler and any tips for using the inside part of the ruler, those inside smaller openings on the rulers. Um, it's a different feel, again, practice, but it's a different feel because if you're going around the outside of the ruler, you're concentrating on uh, holding that ruler against the foot. And now if you're inside the ruler, um, you're kind of, it, it's just, a, it's an opposite feeling. You're still along, you still want to be along the edge of the foot. Um, as far as the ruler you saw in the video that has a circle on the inside, uh, you will go around that circle. Many times you go around it one and a half times in order to move it to, to be a continuous, like if you were doing a row of circles, you would go around it. Every circle you would go around one and a half times so that you always end up at, at the bottom so you can move the ruler along. Great tip, and then move on to the next circle easily. Mm -hmm. uh, Mary mm -hmm. is asking, how do you manage larger projects? You've showed a smaller placemat project. How do you manage larger projects? Um, what, what you have to think about with a larger project is, first of all, um, I, I think in the beginning of my video, I mentioned machine setup, and it's going to be a lot easier if you have your machine down in a table. And, and you just have to recognize that it is going to be easier. If you have a larger project and you have your machine down in a table, I will pull that project on the, on the table. And then if you think about it, I am only going to work, let's say in a placemat size or a 12 inch square. That is the area I'm going to be working on inside that quilt. And because I have that quilt pulled on the table, uh, I'm not going to get a lot of pull from the quilt. I, I want that to be free. So uh, again, it's um, experience and, and doing it. And I think it, you said it before, Deanna, you just have to jump in and, and make it happen. Don't, don't, um, don't fret about it, just do it. And don't think that there isn't any of us that haven't removed stitches because we made a slip. Um, that happens, and, and that's just part of the mm -hmm. course, part of the learning. And um, it is. Just jump We've in all it. done reverse stitching. Just jump in, jump in the deep yes. end. And when I work on larger projects, my sewing machine at home is up against a wall. So when I'm working on larger right. projects, I have to pull it away from the wall. I'm stitching in the middle of the room. But when I do a smaller mm -hmm. placemat size, I can leave it pushed up against the wall. But that's also a handy mm -hmm. tip that I've learned the hard way. The wall pushes back, and then the quilt doesn't move. So... Uh, and, and some tables actually have a uh, piece that you can, they actually Velcro on the edge of the table. So it's sort of like a fence around the outside edge of your uh, table so that your project doesn't fall off the table and then cause you problems because you're in the middle of stitching stuff. Right. That's a good tip, too. The wall will push against it. And then if you don't have a barrier, the, it'll pull 
uh, away as it's trying to fall off the table. So uh, I have several mm -hmm. folding tables that I put around my smaller stitching table. Yes. So, mm -hmm, support that mm -hmm. quilt. Great, great tips. Mm -hmm. Uh, Donna is asking, how can you apply ruler work to negative space? Mm. There's so much you can do um, when we, you know, that gets kind of into the designing with rulers and what kind of things do you want to do in that negative space, whether it's um, straight lines and maybe different directional straight lines to, to form, you know, a, a pattern in that background. There's um, any number of designs, of course, that you could do. I, I tend to love straight line quilting, uh, but, but that's just me. But certainly, again, it, it comes down to designing, um, sitting down and really thinking about how you want to fill that negative space. And, uh, and then, you know, do you want to fill it with straight lines? Do you want to fill it with curves? Do you want to fill it with a design with, with lines around it? You know, what, what is the size of the area? and um, what, what is it that you want to bring out. And speaking of quilting negative space, straight, straight line machine quilting negative space, we have lots of viewers asking about the quilt behind you. Could you tell us about the quilt behind oh, you? Oh gosh. <laughs> uh, yes, this is a quilt I designed uh, probably mm, many years ago. Um, and it's called Nuts and Bolts. And this one is actually quilted with the walking foot. So you can see, I don't know if you can see that quilting. Mm -hmm. um, you must be able to if you're we asking. We sure can. It's beautiful, um, but it, beautiful. But it's all straight line mm -hmm. quilting, and that was done with the walking foot. Right. And it's great to try different techniques, you know, with our walking foot and straight line machine quilting, and then with ruler work. So I've mm -hmm. not done a lot with ruler work. I look forward to trying more of it myself, Nina, and I so mm -hmm. appreciate you sharing your techniques and talents with us today and your time. Thank you for being here today. Oh, it's my pleasure. My and, pleasure, Dean. And please tell us again how we can get in touch with you. Um, I am in the in the process of getting my website up and up and going. Uh, it is ninamcveighdesigns.com. And if you go there now or uh, soon, it is under construction, but there will be an opportunity for you to sign up with your email, and uh, you will then receive an email when the website is up and running um, and I will have my rulers on there as well as some projects and videos. We'll be sure to head over and sign up for your e-news and keep in touch with you and thanks again for for being here. Thank you Deanna, my pleasure. And thanks everybody for tuning in for the Great Wisconsin Quilt Show and be sure to head over to quiltshow.com, check out the vendor mall and take in the beautiful quilt exhibits. Enjoy! Thanks again for joining us. This year's educational presentations are made possible with your contributions. Your support helps us offer a free and accessible online experience where we can celebrate our shared love of quilting. Please help PBS Wisconsin bring back the event next year stronger than ever by making a gift today. You can donate on our website or text QUILT to 1-800-236-3636 to make a gift from your phone. Your generosity makes a difference. Thank you.